just wondering if our microphones were on backstage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were. Uh, um, we, they, they, if they were, then you heard uh, just how attractive we thought all of you guys were uh, <laughs> backstage. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on introductions. I think that you guys uh, have some written materials so we can get right to uh, uh, the meat of this. But my name is Adam Moore. I'm the EEO and Diversity Director of SAG-AFTRA. And we're going to have a fantastic conversation um, with some of our premier talent here in New York City. And um, since it's premier talent in New York City, it's premier talent in the world. Uh, as we all know. Um, and I'll just go down the list. <clears throat> Starting at the, the far end, we uh, are, are very honored to have Montego Glover. You can give it up for each person as we, <laughs> as we clap. Montego's actually going to have to jet out of here a little early. She's performing at the Vineyard Gala uh, th this evening. Um, so a uh, little hint to everybody, philanthropy is the way to go. Give back mm. to your theater community. <laughs> you got to do that uh, when you make it big time. Um, she has an extensive bio, but the thing to know is that uh, the following, uh, which she's on right now, uh, is currently airing. Go check that out if you want an hour of heart-stopping drama yes. uh, uh, where you don't breathe, uh, frankly, for an hour. Uh, uh, check that out. <clears throat> Next to her is um, Uzo Aduba from Orange is the New Black, most recently. <laughs> Just heard that the uh, second season will premiere on June 6th. So set all of your various devices that are connected to Netflix so that you can get that. I think it's on every device you possibly own. <laughs> you can get a Netflix app and watch um, Orange is the New Black. Um, next to her is someone that you've seen on stage and screen everywhere in New York and beyond, Peter J. Fernandez. <laughs> also maybe seen him roaming the halls as he's on faculty here at the New School for Drama, uh, teaching scene study uh, to grad students. Um, he's also currently in All the Way on Broadway with Brian Cranston, uh, the LG, LBJ uh, uh, um, story, which is um, pretty amazing. Um, and last but not least is uh, Tawny Cyprus, um, <laughs> currently on Unforgettable. <laughs> we'll be airing the new uh, episodes will be airing in April, so you can check that out. But I mean, you've seen these people and heard them and seen them on camera and on stage, um, and now we get to hear them for real. It's African American History Month, or I guess it's still called Black History Month. It's hard to keep up with all the different politically correct terminology these days. But the thing to keep in mind, I think, that when we're having this conversation is we want to talk to them about their careers and their insights and their experiences as professionals, first and foremost. But out of that, their experience is certainly going to touch on the times they come up in, the, the, the things that they first got into when they got into this business, the things they see now and the way stories are told, and the way some of these stories have not been told uh, terribly well in the past. And so I think that we're uh, in for a treat to hear from them uh, about all those things. I'm going to start just to give some basic context to what we're talking about. I'm going to quote something that was said at the end of January by Shonda Rhimes. You probably all know her as the showrunner and creator of Grey's Anatomy and Scandal. Um, she won uh, the Directors Guild of America's Diversity Award. Uh, at the end of January. And she got a standing ovation, as well-deserved uh, standing ovation. But she did say something that I thought was kind of interesting, maybe to put this a bit in context. She said, of oh, her and her producing partner, Betsy Beers, we're a little pissed off because there still needs to be an award. Like, there's such a lack of people hiring women and minorities that when someone does it on a regular basis, they're given an award. It's not because of lack of talent, it's because of lack of access. People, who hire, people hire who they know. If it's been a white boys club for 70 years, that's a lot of white boys hiring one another. Mm. Um, those, that sentiment is borne out. If you look at the recent statistics that have come out in different reports, you will see that when it comes to showrunners, only 4% of those are, are minorities when it comes to broadcast uh, dramas and comedies. On cable, it's a little bit better. It's about 7%. When you're talking about lead roles in broadcast television you're, that are you're looking at ethnic minorities, you're talking about 5%. Five, 5%. Five broadcast comedies and dramas. We're talking about cable again, it's a little bit better, 15%. Mm. We're going to have to have a whole other conversation about what you call stuff like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. Is it TV? Is it film? Is it the future? Frankly, I hope so, because I think that we can look towards these new storytellers and you all in the new media realm to hopefully make these numbers look a bit better. But there's clearly a disconnect between 
the world we live in, the audiences that we are, if you look around this room, and the stories that are being told. So with that as the context, and depending on where you all grew up, and I'm going to ask the same question of, of all of you, and we can start here uh, um, next to me uh, uh, with Tawny. Depending on when you, when you grew up and what you watched in, on stage and on camera, um, the examples for sort of your path in this business would be very different, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, if you saw one or any example at all. So when did you first feel like, that's what I got to go do? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, I grew up in New Jersey during the 80s, uh, and television was uh, our babysitter, so uh, my, my dream was always to be in the box, you know? Mm with everybody that I grew up watching. Um, as far as black television goes, okay, let's make it even more specific. Uh, mixed races on television, because that's something you really did not see growing up. The first time I said, there's a reflection of me, was Ray Don Chong. <laughs> Do you remember Ray Don Chong? I love Ray Don Chong. And, and I saw her and I said, you know, she looks like me. If she can do it, I can do it too. And that's when I really realized that I could be on the box uh, along with everybody else. Um, it's not, um, she never, actually I gotta say, she never did really um, uh, black roles or African American parts. She did whatever was put in front of her that she thought she could do. And that's sort of, I've taken my lead from that and I, I sort of follow the same path. You know, I don't, I try not to do black, white, anything else. I'm a mixed race actor and I go out for anything that I think I can do acting wise. So Ray Don Chong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I grew up before time began. Oh, stop. <laughs> 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 I will say, you know, I'm old enough to remember that when we started watching TV in my house, that wasn't something that everybody had. It was now pretty much happening throughout the neighborhood, even for those who didn't have a lot of finances, but TV was still, it wasn't in its infancy, but it was still young. And there weren't that many networks and there weren't that many options. Um, and it was still a big deal that, wow, somebody black's on TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's go to the living room, you know? Let's go see who's on. Sidney Poitier's on TV. Harry Belafonte's on TV. Um, uh, Ruby D, uh, Brock Peters, people like that. So it was a big deal for us. Or there's a black person in a commercial. <laughs> what is that about? You know, so that's what I grew up in. Um, I'm of Cape Verdean descent, which is Portuguese African. Um, and there are those Cape Verdeans who don't consider some, themselves black, but I grew up in an era where, look, it's how you look, it's your skin color. Mm -hmm. So I was a black kid. Um, in terms of me doing it, I was always a storyteller as a kid. I remember my mother would sit me out when friends came over and said, read a book, just read a book. <laughs> uh, I'll always love her for that because it gave me my, my, my deep love for literature. But um, it wasn't until the second or third grade when they started putting me in these little plays. I was a talkative kid, and I realized now I got it from my father, who was a real storyteller. But it wasn't until high school where someone pulled me out and said, you know, you could do this. And I said, well, what does this mean? No, I think you could act. And um, I was in the drama club, and they put me in a few plays. And even still, I wanted to be a, a visual artist um, until my... Uh, art teacher pulled me aside in my senior year of high school and said, listen, you know, uh, we're talking about a career for commercial art with you. And I must tell you, um, I got out after five years. I had three ulcers and it was very competitive. And, and so now I'm in the business that is just as competitive. But I had a drama teacher there who said, I think you can do this for a living. And if you're not sure what you want to do, I think you should audition for some schools. Awesome. Um, and it was in a time when there was money for Minority families who didn't have a lot, and you had good grades, and you could go to school, and I auditioned and got accepted at a few programs, and got accepted. And you still don't know until you have that moment when you get out in the real world and go, Jesus, I can do this, and this is what I want to do. I think that happened about four years after I graduated. And then I went, okay, this is what I want to do. And by then, there were a lot more of us on TV and in film. Maybe not in the ways we'd like them to be, but more. That's me. 
Um, as far as seeing reflections of myself coming back to me, um, my family is of Nigerian descent. I'm first generation uh, Nigerian. And so um, I came from a family of professionals. And so I just remember my parents um, every Thursday night um, making us sit down and join them to watch The Cosby Show. Oh, oh, yes. and that's who doesn't word. love The Cosby Show? <laughs> you know? Of course, sitting down to watch The Cosby Show. And I just remember even more specific than seeing people who looked like me on TV, but a family that I knew mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of their pastimes, in terms of their conversations, in terms of how they related with one another as people. I just knew them and wanted to be a part of that family, no doubt. But um, that was something that struck me and I was drawn towards as a kid and I loved the Cosby show. Um, and then in terms of the doing it, it was because um, people, uh, first generation Nigerians, all, or at least the ones that I knew, went into more professional careers. It was more a typical route for me to pursue something. I thought I was gonna be a lawyer. That's what mm. I thought. You know, I thought that's what I was gonna do. And, um, but for the grace of a creative writing teacher who happened to be my drama teacher uh, mm -hmm. at my school, who one day we were in class, she said, Uzo, can you stay after class? And I was terrified. I didn't know what I did. I was trying to rack through my brain what I could have possibly have done in class. Yeah. And she sat down, she said, you know what, have you given any thought to what you're gonna pursue next? And I was telling her and she said, have you ever thought about going into the arts? And I sang as well. And you know, sang classical music and all of this just sort of as a hobby. But she said, I think, have you ever thought about going into the arts? And it wasn't until that moment, it was my junior year in high school, I'd never given it a thought a day in my life in terms of a profession. I thought it was something that you enjoyed. Yeah. But I didn't necessarily think you, one made a life for themselves doing it. Mm. But that bulb went off that moment for me and I knew it. it is as if my whole life I'd been looking for a key to a door Ooh. and she had just put it in the mm. lock to open it for me. Cool. Um, You've got to hear it for teachers on that one. Right? That's <laughs> really oh, yes, cool. absolutely. The absolutely. influence they can have over your, in your life. That's great. It's Once true. you go. Uh, the same. Um, I am uh, born in Macon, Georgia, and raised in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so my family is Southern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> through and through and through. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, I grew up um, watching PBS um, and seeing plays and operas on public television, like effortlessly, endlessly, and I remember being transfixed by the images and the sounds in that box on those stages that I could see. Um, I started studying acting when I was 12 years old and I had this incredible, incredible teacher um, who just involved a bunch of 12 year olds in producing art. So we took Beauty and the Beast and completely reformatted it and made it into something that we wanted it to be. And we worked on the costumes and the set and the lighting and we put makeup on each other and you know, we presented our wonderful plays. And one time, the very first time we performed together, I remember taking bows with my company mm -hmm. and on the upsweep, just standing there holding the hands of my friends, being so proud of all the work we had put into the piece and seeing our parents and our, you know, teachers out there and some underclassmen out there, you know, clapping for us. I thought, I'm so happy right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy. This is what I want to do. And so, um, it, it turns out, you know, being born and raised in the South, you will be in church, um, and you will be singing. Uh, so I was always singing. I was, you know, we were singing at church, we were singing at home, we were always. Um, so that was always there. I, you know, was an athletic child, a tomboy, so, you know, I had a, a natural ability for, for movement and for moving through space. My father will say it's because he was an athlete, a basketball player, <laughs> we're gonna let him have that. Uh, uh, and so I found a, you know, a great program for, for music and theater. 
uh, and dance and went, went for it. And I'll agree with Uzo, uh, everything changed when I watched plays on public television mm. because I got the classics, I got the things that you want to, you want to be part of the base of an artistic life. But then I put the box on and there was the Cosby Show. Mm -hmm. And these were, these were our people. Wow. And they were marvelous. They were marvelous. I was delighted by them. Life stopped on Thursday at 8 p.m. Yeah. Mm. I think it did for all, most any family yeah. right? I think <laughs> across the board that happens. And I think what's interesting is, is that there'll be themes that we talk about, whether it's stereotype versus authenticity, or some of the things that happen, I think, from any immigrant community. I mean, w about this idea that, look, you're going to go into the professional field. This idea that you go get an arts degree somewhere, that's not going to cut it. That's not how this works. And you could talk to any number of different uh, immigrant uh, communities. I think they would have that same, uh, that same experience. Um, when you all decided, you know, this, this is something <laughs> that, 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 that I need to do, and I think it is a need, I think, for, for most people who get into this, because it's too damn hard otherwise. Hell right? it's, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, so if, if in case there's anything else that you feel is passionate about, might want to try that. Um, <laughs> because this, this, is, this is pretty intense. Um, but once you have committed to yourself, I think first, that that's what you're going to pursue, uh, you then have to go find other like-minded folks to go do that work with, whether it's in academia, um, or in a community environment that you go put up on your own shows. I'm not sure who wants to take this first, but what was your sort of first experience meeting up with people who were all about doing that work to get you to that kind of that next professional level, not the, the level beyond I'm interested in this and it's that first time where you're amongst people who you realize this is a living, this is a profession, this is art and life together that I can actually put food on the table with. Um. Wow. I mean, I will say, uh, you know, at 18, I got my first uh, stock job, you know, went to a mass audition with a bunch of, you know, my student friends at FSU, and, and we got jobs, and I remember getting to, you know, the community summer theater where we were going to be working for, you know, three months or so, and just being delighted that I had auditioned, I had gotten a job. Hmm. I was going to be doing 8,000 shows in rep in six weeks, like just working my can off <laughs> for, I think my salary, I'm not kidding, was like $225 a week. Mm. And I was like, I'm in the money, you know? <laughs> I'm making money. I'm doing what I love to do, it's amazing. Like I was on top of the world, you know? And, it, it, and now we were laughing because it's laughable, but, uh, at the time, it was tremendous. I was, I was doing what I wanted to do, what I loved to do, what I was training to do, and getting paid to do it. And at that moment, I thought, you can do this. You can go into a room and put your wares in front of a, a group of people and have them accept it and compensate you for it. And art can meet commerce. I've taken that with me since that moment to this moment. Uh, oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. please, go. I was going to say, um, when I, I think my, my first experience with that had to be when I just moved to New York, and I was doing a show down at this, it does, I don't even think the theater actually exists anymore. I think it just closed. It's called the Greenwich Street Theater. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a small, like, black box theater. And like Montego, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't have ran to that phone fast enough to tell my mother that I was gonna get $75 for the length of the run. <laughs> Start of rehearsal, get that money. closing night. Oh, oh Lord. So great. And <laughs> with a puffed chest, no less, yeah. you know. <laughs> really proud about it, but I was so, I, I was so, and am still, frankly, so proud of it. Yes. You know, I, and I think in line with your question, answer to your question, I felt surrounded by people who at the end of the day, you, you could have not paid me. Mm -hmm. And we were all there for the work. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you could have, you would have bet every single person in that rehearsal room was making 10 million a week. <laughs> the amount of heart 
and work mm -hmm. and focus and dedication and love and passion was going into it. You would have bet money that that is how much, we were making $75 for the length of the run. <laughs> you people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, the actors, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was just so, I couldn't wait to go home to work on it. I couldn't wait to come back to work on it. I, and I knew everybody felt the exact same way and we felt like it was good and we wanted to give all of ourselves to it. And I felt like I was at home or certainly in a community of people that I had just been aching to rub against. Wow. Ladies first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think um, I'm gonna go um, with the the moment when I really felt like I could do um, not just acting, because I'm a Leo, and I've always thought, like, this is what I can do, I can do this, I've always been, like, gung-ho about being on stage and learning acting, and, and I did all that. The moment for me that, that was a real eye-opener was um, I went out for, a, a, for Heroes, and I auditioned for uh, a part they had me auditioning for a role that in the script said, white woman with black child. That's what, how it was described in the script. And I thought, I'm not going to this audition, are you kidding? They're looking for a, they're looking for a gimmick, it's obvious. But I went anyway because the script was so good and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go, screw it. I'm just gonna take the time and, and have that five minutes of acting and, and just have fun with it. So I did it and I got the screen test and it was me and a white girl auditioning for this role, which was obviously going to a white girl. But they, they, they didn't cast me in that role. They, <laughs> but they took another role that was a, a, a white role in the script and they changed it to suit me. They said, oh, we'd like you to be a part of the script. We want you to be a part of the show. We're gonna change this role to suit you. And I, in that moment, I thought, I can audition for anything. Mm -hmm. I can audition for anything that they put in front of me. And that changed everything for me, for me, personally. Yeah. <laughs> It's a little backward. Um, my first job, I was lucky enough to get a job and get my equity card right out of school. Um, I left Boston, I grew up in New England, and I went to Seattle, which was the other side of the world as far as I'd I was concerned. I had never traveled. I mean, I'd been on a plane on the East Coast, but never traveled. So I'm going to see the world, and the East Coast is, the West Coast is way over there, and there are actual mountains instead of the bumps we have here. But. <laughs> Um, I was hired as part of a, a, a theater that was producing a little satellite theater for, um, for young audiences, children's plays. And they said, we're going to tour the whole Pacific Northwest, which we did in a van and had all these wonderful adventures. And we were all young and having a great time creating this theater. But I think the time when I really felt that, wow, I can do this, and yes, that feeling of ensemble, because I think that's what you're talking about, there are times in this business when you can feel absolutely alone in the middle of a room of 45 people because nobody's on the same plane. Mm. But when you're in an ensemble, that kind of feeling is rare and it's just incredible. You feel like you can do anything and everybody else. Well, I think I began to feel that in my second year in Seattle because they asked me to stay, not go back to Boston at the summertime, come back and be part of the, the season. Um, and in a regional theater, you're in a city and you, they produce plays throughout the season. So the season runs from maybe August through May. So I'm going to be there year round. You start to perform with the same group of people for a city full of audiences who come and see you on a regular basis. So they begin to watch your growth. They begin to see how you change and morph you begin to develop a real relationship with these people. And after a while, I felt like, wow, I'm part of a family that's a lot larger than the normal family, but we're all growing together. Um, they're watching my triumphs and they're watching me stumble, but I'm getting to a place where, you know what, this is what I can do and this is what I'm going to do, for better or for worse. Uh, of course, New York's a, another ball of wax, but Seattle's where I got mine. That's awesome. That's, uh, and, and you, yes, no, we, we can clap for that. That's, yeah. that's good stuff. And, you know, I mean, I think, I don't want to hit it too, but find a point on it, but, um, and Tawny talked about coming up through stage as well um, before re relaying her story about heroes. 
Um, but in an age where people sometimes think and students sometimes think that, you know, look, I can just get myself on camera, man, I can make this. <laughs> and because why not? People are, you know, execs are looking at YouTube and people are going plucking people from obscurity all the time. And I can go have my, you know, discovered in a hairdresser's moment, mm. uh, <laughs> virtually speaking. Mm. Uh, sometimes there isn't as much emphasis placed on the craft and understanding where the foundation is, um, being part of a collaborative effort, being part of an ensemble, feeling like you can trust in the people that you're working with. Um, we've all seen movies and TV and plays where, uh, as Peter was saying, it's almost like everybody's in a different show. You know, you might be interested in one of those shows that somebody's in, but the, the rest of everybody else is in a show you probably don't want to see. Um, and, and that gets at, I think, something that, that oftentimes happens um, when people are trying to tell stories that somehow don't, don't ring very true, right? They're, they're stories because they, they, they think this public, this obscure public wants to see. Like that's gonna play in the middle America or that's gonna be what people wanna see because of a focus group. And so they try to tell stories about things perhaps they don't know very as well or they think that people may wanna see and there isn't that authenticity to it. Um, and, and Montego, I don't mean to keep picking on you to, to go first, but, but um, over the course of your career, um, starting in Summerstock, and hopefully people in the audience still know what Summerstock is. We're not going to spend a whole <laughs> bunch of time on it, but... Maybe one or two, right? You know, <laughs> let, let's just make sure. Um, going from there to the things that you're doing now and everything in between, what have you seen in terms of the changes in the kinds of roles that, that you would see in the breakdowns? or the things that you, uh, when you have representation that your agent would bring to you, in terms of the kinds of roles and characters that either other people kind of come to you and say, I think this is what you can do, and where you, your own idea about what you bring to the table and, and sort of how has that changed and how do you navigate that, and making sure that you get to play the things that you feel passionately about and, and, and maybe some of the instances where you weren't able to do those kinds of things and kind of had to find your way. Yeah. Um you know, I think it's important. I like to maintain this as a as a, a center. I love acting. I love storytelling. I love the process of teasing out a story and, and feeling out characters and feeling out the world of a play. Even when I'm working on a TV or a film script, I still call it the play um, because I, I cut my teeth in that space. So I... I, I deal with it in the same sort of context. And to me, it's all the same because it's all storytelling, just in different media. Um, and what I've always wanted to maintain is the love of the work. If I'm not loving the work, if I'm not passionate about it, then I have to take my hands off of it because it really is for another actress. It really is for someone else because there's something else I should have my hands on. And there's more than enough mm. work and storytelling out there for every single one of us. I like to operate from a, play, from a place of um, bounty and not scarcity, um, which I think allows me with other people who are like-minded to embrace each other when we're working on ensemble pieces mm -hmm. because there's a, a place for every one of us at the table. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, um, the, the changes for me have really been about my growth. Um, in, in the theater, for example, I just... I feel so passionately about the classics. So I always want the opportunity for um, me to exercise in any classic uh, you know, realm. Um, and when it comes to music, I always want the opportunity to work in the classics as well as more contemporary things because I think it keeps me, I can't think of a better phrase, it keeps me popping, keeps me sparkling, you know, keeps your eyes alive on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, and as I've grown as an actress, I've seen the level of uh, complexity come back to me when I'm ready to go to the next level. For example, being able to play um, a person with a mental disorder or being able to play a person who's blind or being able to um, understand someone who is completely different from me, being able to reach forward or back or sideways wherever I need to go to get to the space where that person lives in the world of their play. Um, and so with that in mind, I've always, I've, I've always felt like the, the momentum has been moving forward, forward, forward all the time. And always 
complex, interesting characters, always. Um, I'm very, very lucky. I get to work in so many different media, including uh, television and film, and even small things like um, a commercial, being able to, to be a voice actor and voice avatars and voice characters for animated series and things like that. It's a very tasty way to work. It's very different from walking out on stage and presenting a play in front of someone or stepping onto set, but it's as specific and as uh, in need of your attention as an artist, and I've always responded to that. Peter, do you, do you want to, your take on how things maybe have changed in terms of the opportunities of the stories that you get to tell, that get to be told? I think the industry has changed a lot, particularly over the last 10 years, but over the last 20, um, in terms of its vision and the world that it represents, it's beginning to open up more, it's less myopic. Um, but I think uh, part of that change begins with ourselves. For me, um, I've had a pretty varied career. I've done a lot of classical theater, a lot of kitchen sink drama. I do the occasional musical. I've done uh, more stage than television and film, but I've done more than dabble in all of that, too. Um, but I think you create your own opportunities, and, and now even more so than before. Um, how you think about yourself and the things that you can do and want to do has a lot to do with how the business will think about you and what you can do. I tell my students this all the time. <laughs> the tendency in this business is to put you in a block, in a box. Um, well, if you want the box to be big and wide, then you have to create that. You have to plan that for yourself, which means don't put limitations on yourself. Um, the things you dream about, you better go on out and do it. Mm. Um, make it happen. If you can't do it, align yourself with people who can, who can provide the opportunity. Um, I love to be around people who think outside the box. Um, I hang around with young people a lot these days. <laughs> I love to do new plays. Um, they just have, a, there's a new, it's, 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 it's a less specific, it's a more inclusive model. And I think I've always thought that way. So I seek out the things I want to do. And it, the level will change. Sometimes it's doing it in a little tiny theater with seven or eight other people who think the same way. But you know, somebody in that room is going to have a connection to somebody someplace else who has more facilities, who has more opportunity. And all of a sudden, there's some more money behind it. Those kinds of stories are being told. So I think it's a combination of me thinking in a lateral way and the business beginning to think in a lateral way. I mean, the people that it serves, the audience is so much more diverse. Mm -hmm. um, television and film, nowadays, it's not unusual when my agent will say, okay, well, they want to see you for such and such a guy, and it's not the black guy. Right. It's <laughs> that guy, and it will go to whoever comes into the room mm -hmm. that can inhabit that. Now, what kind of guy are you bringing into the room? That's up to you. But I see that a lot more, specifically in television and film. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I, I'm going to agree with, with Peter because I think that um, when I first started in this industry, it was when you read a breakdown, it was looking for an African-American woman, looking for a Hispanic woman, looking for a white woman. And now it's a lot more, it's like all ethnicities. Yes. <laughs> and, and whoever is the best actor is going to get it, you know? Um, but at the same time, I also think that, you know, and it, 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 me personally, I grew up and became much more relaxed. As an actor, when you first start out in this industry, um, you keep all of your training here, <laughs> right here. <laughs> and, you're, and you're doing your circle breathing exercises before you go in for your audition. And that's circle. just how it is because that's, that's, you remember it all and it's all right there. But as the years go on, you let it go a little bit more. You realize you have to let it go. Uh, for me, uh, audition pilot season is a full-time job. Yes. I, ha I can do four auditions a day during pilot season. And you can't, you just can't. So, so a lot of the, the change that I've had over the past decade has been me relaxing and realizing that, okay, maybe this isn't the most perfect role for me. Maybe this is uh, a little dry, this character. But um, I'm gonna, I'm, you know what, I've got a, a teenager at home, 
I got, I got a husband, I'm gonna make this work, I'm gonna relax into it and make this work. So it's that and it's also the industry expanding what it's looking for. You know, we have a black president. You know, the world is changing. 24 did it first, actually. <laughs> they had, they had a sure. black president. That's right. So, <laughs> so the world is changing, you know, and you get, you get a lot more of that. So um, uh, the all ethnicities thing has really come full circle. Sure. sure. There was a there was Cherry Jones as president too, so maybe we'll get a woman president. <laughs> yes. next, right? That, that's right. That's the next thing. Twenty four is the template for our that's national right. government. Um, Uzo, do you have anything that you want to contribute to that, or or, your, or maybe perhaps your interaction about how you make sure that the people who are advocating for you also understand where you're coming from and what what you want out of your career? Oh well, I think that is as important as the work personally. Um, I think something that you always have to hold on to for yourself is knowing who you are as an artist and what you want to be aligned with in terms of the creation of art. And it is incredibly important to make sure that is, it is incredibly clear to those people with whom you've aligned yourself to understand what that is for you because if you, it's like anything, if you're not clear, you know, just what we were saying here about the box, if you're not clear about who you are, how can anybody else be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that can't, it's just not possible, you know? It's really that simple. It, it, it is. <laughs> it really it really, is it really is. So I know that, um, you know, I, I, I know what I want to make. I know that when, um, when I started with my representation, we had a meeting and I just told them, you know, I love the theater. That's not something that's dead to me now, you know, because <laughs> we're doing this thing right now. Mm -hmm. right. That is something that I'm forever going to love, forever want to be doing, and that was respected. And I know that I'm most attracted to, and actually Orange really gave me this education because Ar I did a thing just right before Orange, but like essentially Orange was my first experience with um, TV work, but I, it became even more clear to me doing the show that what I love are great stories, not just good stories, great stories. That's what I'm attracted to. I feel like that's where I am uh, most useful. I feel like I'm not a useful actor in something that's sort of mundane. I, f I, I don't rise to it in the way that I think because I kind of can comment on it, you know, but I like, in my work, you know. <laughs> this ain't it, you know. Um, like you, can see, you can see it, you know. That's but like, funny. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't, but it's like, I think that um, I, I am attracted to that and, and I'm very, very thankful that I, um, I'm surrounded by people who are mutually attracted to that as well and, and making that work in my life. I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that way. Um, and I think that clarity is, I think that clarity really just burns a path for you regardless and puts in place for you the people who have that same mission state statement. Hmm. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. You have to make sure that everybody's clear as to what you, you're after, because how else are you going to ever achieve that? Yeah. Um, you can't. Along you're just those wandering. same lines, as far as representation goes, I honestly believe that it's not, it's not however big, you know, the biggest agent that you can get or the, 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 the well, most well-known manager that you can get. I honestly believe you have to find people who believe in you. Such when you don't believe in yourself, because there are going to be so many times you don't believe in yourself, but you still have to go. <laughs> so, so it's really helpful to have people in your corner who believe in you and say, you know what, you don't, you don't think you look good today, but you really do. And I believe in you and you can do this, you know, because it's, you know, I, I'm not with the biggest agent in the world and I've had the opportunity to go. And I've said no, you know, because these people have, have really believe in my abilities. And, and that's what matters mm -hmm. the most, you know? If I didn't have that, I'd 
wouldn't be here, you know? They get me my work, they get me my auditions. The most important thing is to have somebody that says, that reads the script and says, Tawny would be perfect for this. <laughs> they submit her, <laughs> you know? That's what you want. It's so true. You don't want somebody with a big name just to go and be like, oh yeah, my agent is so-and-so, you know? It's, it's what? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I call my people Team Glover. That's their name. <laughs> That's they like nice. it. <laughs> they should be, they have to be, they, yeah. they better be. Yeah. Um, so we've, you've been talking about some, some things about you know, how you can go about doing it the right way and, and, and you obviously all have your own professional and personal successes and the confidence you bring into the room. I have to believe there's been at least one instance in your careers where perhaps you went into a room and somebody brought something in that you were not expecting. And this is something that I mean, as, as actors, uh, it's amazing to me that you, you voluntarily show up to places <laughs> to put yourself through that garbage. Easy. It's unnatural. Because that seems like it's just yeah. insanity uh, yeah, to invite that kind of abuse yeah. and judgment. Yes. And, and not occasionally, perhaps. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and occasionally, Everyone's perhaps, uh, as people in the audience, and I've read some of these questions here, you know, you'll encounter some people who aren't quite. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's say they, they aren't the, 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 the best example of New Yorkers, mm. right? Uh, <laughs> no. Cosmopolitan, well-versed, uh, well-educated people who they might bring in some of their own stuff and uh, stereotypes and strange questions. I mean, can you guys talk a little bit about something that you encountered and then had to deal with in the moment and kind of give people some clue as to, you can prepare and you can, you, can, you can set your focus and you can do as much as you want to do, but sometimes you get in that room and somebody says something to you like, are you really from, or, oh. or you know, something along the lines of, well, you know, you're not quite fitting the skin type we were looking for, oh. or you know, this is ethnically ambiguous and to me you look, you know. Is, what is, are is you? It? That's the question. <laughs> what, what are what, you? What, was it? what are you? <laughs> what are you? Okay. I had a casting director who's fairly well known and Actually, I did work for her later on, but this was early in my... She did the right thing in the room, so this is important <laughs> to listen to. Be, but this was early in New York, and um, I came into the room, and I'd done my prep, and she sat down, and she said... She didn't even ask me any questions other than, so, what are you? Oh, Jesus, H. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> no, what, what are you? Mm. <laughs> Now, I know where we were going. Sure. So I said, I'm going to play it down. And I did. Oh, there you go. You got I said, excuse me, what are you? This went on and on and on. <laughs> I kept thinking, you know, she's going to break and she's going to tell me to get out or whatever. But she, she never broke character. What are you? What are you? And finally she said, you know, your makeup, what are you? Because you're kind of black and you're kind of Latin, but you're not both, so what are you? Wow. Yikes. I said, well, what do you want me to be? <laughs> there we go. There it is. That's the man there who gets a job next time That's out. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that obviously doesn't happen as much as it used to, but <laughs> you'd be surprised. <laughs> well, you know, not as boldly, but. Right. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. People are at least maybe a bit sheepish about asking. Uh, <laughs> I think right. auditioning in general is, for the most part, the worst thing you could do to an actor. I mean, nine times out of 10, <laughs> you're in a tiny little room, the lighting's awful. Oh, sad. How many times? Uh, it's you and a video camera and, the ca and, and a casting director who is not an actor. Oh, God. He's not an actor. <laughs> and it's like acting with wood. I mean, there are, there are great acting, uh, casting directors. Marsha DeBonis is a, oh, is a big time fantastic. casting director. And she's also an actress. She has been in a lot of movies. And she's fantastic. Going in and reading with her is fantastic. But with her in the room, this is funny because my, my manager is here. And I was telling, we were talking about doing comedy earlier and how much I would love to do more comedy because I think I'm freaking hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> but I was auditioning with Marsha DeBonis and in the, it was a comedy thing which I never get to do. And so in the middle of the audition, she stopped me. She goes, you do know this is supposed to be funny, right? <laughs> and that was, the, that was like the last time I ever auditioned for comedy. So that was pretty bad. <laughs> that, was, that, was pretty, that was pretty rotten. Candid feedback, though. <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah. that. There's that. Wow. Yeah. 
I'm like, I'm not funny. <laughs> this, this is golden. Yeah. <laughs> no. I've never gotten a question in terms of what am I, because I feel like no one's going to be like wondering. <laughs> what does it um, mean? Does like, it have to be. I've never Fair. gotten that. I'm weird in the same like some, some other thing no, that you had to deal with in the moment, perhaps. Yeah, I, I was, mean, I do definitely get questions about my name, the polite and ginger way of, you know, like, so what is Uzo? You know, what is that? <laughs> what is, you know I get that. But um, um, th I've, I've been in a room, I had one time, this actually happened early on, it's like, I was, I don't know what I was auditioning for, but I must have caught him just, fresh from some hysteria or something that happened because he was not having it. When I tell you he was turned to zero, he was <laughs> turned to zero. Like he came in, I came in and there was already a paper, newspaper meaning, oh. on the desk <laughs> and a sandwich. And apparently I was in the play perform in front of somebody while they read the paper and eat a sandwich yep. because <laughs> I, was, I was watching that show happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. With great interest, you know. <laughs> what are you reading that's so captivating? You can't happen even next. Look up. You can't even. <laughs> you know, that was an interesting experience. But then I remember, I, I, and I was starting to fall into his energy yeah. and lose my audition, essentially, you know, um, and I remember just thinking after that I, that I can't I can't try and make anybody do think be more anything towards me or whatever. I just have to do what I do, and that's okay. it. Yeah. Antigua, okay. would you? I, I hate to do this to you, but I want to make sure you know. Yes, yes. And I'll so, if okay. you would like to share, um, before you go. I, I mean, I'm with, I'm with Uzo. I don't, there's not a lot of guessing when I walk in the room, um, which I suppose is helpful <laughs> to some degree. Um, but I do get, because I have a, an unusual, we have <laughs> unusual uh, first name and a famous last name, although I am not famous, um, it can be very sort of strange. And so um, there was, <laughs> there was a, an instance where one, um, a person behind the table said, so um, you are Jamaican? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think my script said I'm supposed to agree, but I was like, no. And there was a moment where I was just not so fun. I wasn't quite as sparkly or interesting to her because I wasn't ethnic enough? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a moment. We both just took a beat. She let me know that she was disappointed. <laughs> I let her know that I was sorry. And uh, we read, and that was the end. Um, and then there was another instance, and this was just a silly one that I was like, just, <laughs> I didn't see this coming. But I walked into the room, Montego Glover, and oh, oh, wonderful. Oh, no, your father must be just so proud. <laughs> and I was just like, Yes, he is. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yes, he is. Later, ah. later, we figured out that we weren't talking about the same thing. Mm. <laughs> you let the, like Peter said, what do you want me to be, right? Yes. I'll be whatever you need me to be for this role, and that'll be fine. Yeah. Let's um, give it up for Montego uh, as she has to go. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Glover, for being here. Thank you. If you can follow that guy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so now we can get to the real conversation. Um, no. <clears throat> um, along those same lines uh, about kind of making sure that the, the people in the room can kind of have some, some good takeaways from, from uh, frankly, your uh, terrible experiences. Um, uh, I don't want to dwell on the terrible experiences, but also the, the successes about, you know, this is all about how do you navigate your own and carve your own career, and, and you guys feel very strongly uh, about these things, and I want to make sure that um, everybody understands how it is that they can embrace that themselves. I say this to my students, and it was said to me, and I believe it with all my heart. Um, the scary place, the uncertain place, is the place to live if you want to grow. If you're not willing to jump off the cliff, you'll stay where you are. Now, that may be satisfactory for you, oh. and it may be satisfactory for others. But if you really want to find out 
what could be, that's the place to go and stay there. It's uncomfortable often. It's really scary. But that's where the magic comes. Um, I heard that from a movement teacher when I was in school way back in the covered wagon days. <laughs> and I know it's true, because the times when I said, OK, take a breath and go. This is really scary. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know what the result is going to be. I found out things about myself I had no clue were there that have come forward in my work somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not just this business, man. That's life. Yeah, right? that's, I think so. I think that's something you could take with you. No well, and in, in this business, too, because along the box line, they will define you and say, OK, that's where we want you to stay. Um, and it can be lucrative sure. doing something that everybody likes that you do. But in terms of your growth and how you feel about yourself in the world and how you feel yourself in, in the midst of the art that we try to create, um, that can be very limiting. Uh, and at the end of the day, I don't want to be able to sit back and go, Jesus, I would have, could have, should have. You know, some things you'll try and OK, didn't work out. Boy, that was a bomb. But you're not going to know until you try it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Very true. Um, as far as like going into the audition experience, I had this, this picture painted to me one time about when you're in the audition room or audition waiting room, that you should imagine this garbage bag or garbage can just outside the room. And you go in and you've done all your work and you take it with you along with your sides and you go in the room and you do what you do in the room. And then once you come out, you put everything in this imaginary mm. garbage can. Mm. You put the sides, you put the work you've done at home, you put your fears, you put just all your stuff in it, and you tie it up and throw it away. That's mm. crazy. That's because you can't take it, it with you. No pun intended. But you know, like you can't, you know, you can't take it with you because if you do, it just keeps layering and layering on. And I thought that was such a really smart and great way of releasing it afterwards. No, that, that's, that's fantastic. Because you, you, I mean, you'll hear people talk about, you know, leaving stuff at the door before you go in <laughs> and just to come in with yourself or, mm -hmm. or come in with. It's somewhat unrealistic, right? Yeah, to to totally. think that you can leave a part of yourself before you walk in and then expect to actually bring that to what you're trying to do. Yeah. But leaving all of those things that are associated with it as you, as you walk out, I think is, that's, good. That, that's tremendous. Yeah, that's agreed. great. That's great. Um, <clears throat> I think of two different uh, things. Uh, I come back to do two different things. And then I, I tell people something. Uh, the one thing, when I was in high school, I went to a vocational high school uh, for acting and um, some hackneyed soap opera actor came and talked to us uh, one day and he the, literally the only thing I remember him saying was and you said it earlier if there's anything in this world that you think you might possibly enjoy doing go do that and I thought right then and there I thought well I guess this is the business for me because there's nothing else in the world like I could possibly ever want to do and I, I think of that all the time when I when I realized that I'm neck deep in this business now, and there's no getting out of it. Um, but the other thing I remember, uh, we were talking earlier about um, when you first start out and you have your training just right in front of you all the time. And um, I had to cry on cue, uh, my very first job I ever got. I had to cry on cue, it was for NYPD Blue. And I called up my mentor, Barbara Marchant, um, and I said, hey, Barbara, they're going to make me cry on cue, and I don't know what the hell I'm going to do because I'm fresh out of college and da-da-da-da-da. And she said, this is what you're going to do. Breathe. <laughs> just breathe. Listen to what they're saying to you. Listen to the words you're saying to them, and just do. And that always comes back to me. Because, and that's what I was saying, like eventually you let go of, you, you have the training, you always do your homework and da, da 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 but you let it go. Because in the moment, it's just you and them. And you're breathing and listening and talking and that's it. Yes, you have boundaries of words that you have to say and, 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 and show emotion through those words, but 
it's just you and them. That's it. It's that simple. And so I always come back to that breathe, just breathe. And um, yeah. Oh, and also, the one thing I tell to everybody, anybody who asks me, I say, dream big. That's the best thing you could possibly do for yourself. Dream big, massive. Because even if you don't get that far, you're going to get a lot further than most people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to a couple questions from the audience here in a second. But I wanted to ask you guys, um, you make your living here in New York City. You, you, you live here. It's film, theater, stage, everything you could possibly imagine. Um, we get to see more and more studio space being built all the time, so hopefully a lot of that work can come and stay. And thanks to the state uh, uh, governor uh, and uh, the assembly and, and the mayor's office, we have these tax incentives to keep work coming back and all that stuff. Wh why do you, I mean, what is it about the city that, that, that makes it the place that you want to do your work and live and, and play? I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of work other parts of the world, mm -hmm. including L.A. and everywhere else. I have my reasons for staying in New York. I think I'd like to hear maybe about you guys about why, why, you, why you choose this place. Um, well, I grew up in New Jersey, so that's logical that I would come to New York. I was a bartender at the Limelight at 18. Like, this is my life. All right. Yes. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. Um, but beyond that, I did a pilot season in LA one, one year, um, and it is so different. I always say New York is where you go to find yourself, because nobody cares who you are. <laughs> you can be whoever you want. Every day, somebody new. And LA is where you go to, to hide who you are and look like everybody else. Auditioning in LA, um, I, I had girls that would say, you're going to wear that, like right before I went into an audition. I screen tested for something, and the guy doing my makeup for the screen test said, ooh, those bags under your eyes, just don't look down. I was like, I'm about to go in and audition for my life. What do you mean, don't look down? <laughs> I'm going to do the audition like this? And, and, and that's, 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 that's auditioning in LA. It's very, very, I feel camaraderie in New York. You know, Everybody is their own competition in New York. We don't compete against each other. If I don't get the job, you'll get the job. And good for you, you know? And if I can help you, you need my sides, take my sides. And that's what New York is like. In LA, it's more like, you know, they, everybody's vying for this, and there's not enough parts, and there's too many actors, and, and, and it's cutthroat, you know? So New York, pfft, it's home. <laughs> Plus, I know everybody. I know everybody here. <laughs> um, well, I moved to New York. I was in New York one summer during school, and I just, I knew that I came here because I had come here in the fourth grade with my parents. My dad was here on a business trip, and we, my mom was like taking us around the city, and we saw Les Mis, and I thought it was amazing, and I was, I just remember the lights and the speed, and I love the theater very much, so, um, and then, so then one summer when I was here, my cousin had picked me up from the train station and was just telling me, you know, he had, you know, grown up in New York City and was just telling me, I just will never forget, he was like, Uzo, the best live in New York. And he wasn't even, he's a lawyer, he wasn't an act, you know, an actor, he was like, the best, the best of the best live in New York. He said, the best lawyers live in New York, the best doctors live in New York, the best <laughs> finance people live in New York, he's like, You'll never meet a homeless person who's going to beg like somebody in New York. <laughs> My God. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. It's, it's really true. And he said, the best of the best. And, um, <clears throat> and I was, and they are the best, you know. Um, and I thought, you know, as soon as he came through on the, sh you know, excuse me, ladies. No, I just, I thought like, that really just impacted me in a way that I thought um, that, coupled with the energy of the city, the, it's just the heartbeat of the city, mm -hmm. just felt so in line with what I wanted to be a part of. Just the pace, the, the mood, the swag, the, the, the type of artists. I, I'd, not, I'd been to LA before, but not in any official capacity in terms of work. I just, I just knew that I wanted to be where they were. You know, um, 
So that made me move to New York. I've never, um, I've been to LA, obviously. Um, I've never been a part of the circuit um, in Los Angeles. Um, I like LA, that weather. Um, yeah. Not mad yes. at it, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> I'm from California, I spent a dozen years in New York. I'm not hating on California, no. but there is, there's a reason people choose this place, I think, and, yeah. and, and Peter. It's all here, I mean, on a grand scale and on the most minute scale. Um, New York keeps you honest. I mean, look at the people who live here. You, you rub up against them all the time. You can't live here and hate Everybody, you just can't do it. No. They're in your lap. <laughs> I mean, they are. Literally. And so, you know, that stimulation, the, that, all the culture that's here, the different cultures that are represented, the artwork, I mean, come on. Um, yes, crime and everything else is here. It's, I mean, the best and the worst is all here, and I think that's what life is all about. And, and, it, and, it, and it escorts you, it carries you along, it... It stops you up cold. It pimp slaps you. Mm -hmm. It caresses you. I mean, it does the whole thing. It's, it, it, the, the vitality of this place can't be matched anywhere else. And ultimately, that's the, the, the food that feeds the engine, at least for me as an artist and as a human being. Uh, it keeps me honest. As an artist, you want to see the life. You want to see everybody in California, everything's sp so spread out. But here, it's, you're on top of each other. You can sit on a subway line and see vast, you know, uh, so many uh, um, a kaleidoscope of people, you know, a whole, and, and, and you get ideas and you, you, you use that. You can hook in your up art. with each other and have lunch here. You can't do that in LA. <laughs> yeah. You can run into each other on the street. Oh man, let's go have a cup of coffee. I haven't seen you in a while. Let's talk. Out there, you got to make appointments and you got to drive. <laughs> Can't take that. And even you I think there's something drive. too, you know, just for people. At least everybody says there's a lot of actors, you know, and it's, a, it's an industry town, you know, Los Angeles. Like, I think there is something to the feeding of the engine, having no choice but to associate with people who have nothing mm -hmm. to do with what you what you do and becoming educated on what those people do. The, I have a lot of friends, most of my friends actually, who are not actors or in the entertainment industry at all. And just that exposure in itself keeps you grounded. Keep, keeps you grounded and I think also br introduces you to a viewpoint that you yes. might not necessarily get if you That's are right. constantly floating in this homogenous pool. Right, so you're not surrounded by other people playing other people, right. you're actually surrounded by other people. Other people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a great yeah. distinction. That's a great so that's distinction. Nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of nice to, I also, uh, I'll tell people what I do and nobody in New York cares. Yeah. yeah. And I kind of so find that refreshing Love it. Um, somehow. Um, a lot of the questions really uh, that, that, that came in from the audience kind of get at this, at this one idea of responsibility that, that you as uh, actors and artists who are the, the face of the stories and the storytellers, the responsibility that you feel as individuals, and there's no right or wrong answer to this, and it's, it's all an individual thing, but the ownership that you would take and the responsibility you feel for um, either choosing to do or choosing not to be a part of telling a story that may be stereotypical, mm -hmm. that may play into um, this idea of inauthenticity and stereotype that, that is negative. Uh, that perpetuates things that would, that would be better off to get away from. Um, do you think about that? I mean, you've talked about the choices that you've made, but I mean, that specific idea of, you know, what is it that you believe your responsibility is to yourself and then also to the audiences who will see it? Um, I'll take the play that I'm working on right now. We're in previews. We open March 6th. We're still in rehearsal. Um, when I took this part, when it was offered to me, we did it in Cambridge first, and now we're doing it on Broadway. Um, it's not a huge part. Actually, everybody in the play, except for two people, doubles and triples. Mm -hmm. So we're all playing other characters, too. Um, but it was important for me to do this play um, because it's dealing with an important time in our history, and it seems we're reliving those times even now. Um, the the, the um, time when the Civil Rights Bill was first passed, 
um, the uh, Voting Rights Act, which has since been rescinded by the Supreme Court. It dealt with important issues, and it also dealt with the time when I was growing up, coming of age. Um, now, the character, the main character that I play in the play is um, Roy Wilkins, and he was the head of the NAACP at that time. Now, he's in the play, Martin Luther King Jr. is in the play, Stokely Carmichael is in the play, um, Bob Moses is in the play, Ralph Abernathy is in the play, um, Coretta Scott King is in the play, and Fannie Lou Hamer. Those are the black people, and then there are a couple of others who, no, Aaron Henry, and a couple of others who have no names, or kind of constructs. Um, and of course, the play is about LBJ, his first year in office, passing that bill and trying to get reelected. Well, it was important to do the play because we're dealing with important issues. Um, but what was really important was, how are these black men portrayed on stage for me? It's a wonderful script, but when we got into rehearsal, and this was also part of taking the job, I trusted that the director and the writer wanted to hear what I had to say. I'm at a stage in my career where I'm really not interested in working on material, even if it's a Broadway play. If you're not interested in what I have to say about what I'm doing, if I'm just going to say the words, be quiet, then I'm not interested in that. Because though he wrote what I think is close to reality, there are still essences, nuances, and things about those men in that play and at that time that I want to make sure are exact on stage because it's important. <laughs> and we have gone back and forth. They, you have three eras of the social rights leaders, the civil rights leaders. You have the older generation, you have Martin and Ralph, the middle generation, and then you have Bob Moses and Stokely, who were the young firebrands, who said, look, let's just get out and bash heads. Um, so they have two scenes in the play where they clash a lot, differing philosophies. Mm -hmm. Um, about how we go ahead and deal with the situation, even as the situation is morphing. And the danger for us always has been, those actors in the play, is that these scenes don't just become about angry black men. Because, you know, angry black men is attractive in this business. Mm. We love that energy. Oh, you guys were great. But it's the ideas that they're angry about. Mm -hmm. What is the argument? And the struggle has always been to maintain that argument. Now, in a different room with different people, we might, not lose, we might lose that battle. In this case, there's room for that dialogue. And they've allowed us to begin to, to, to structure and, 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 and fill the space in what I think is a true way and what the other men on stage I'm with think is a true way. And we still go back and forth about it. But it's an environment where we can play with nuance, um, getting at the truth of these people. That's important to me. And if I didn't feel like that opportunity would be afforded. I don't think I would do this, even though this is an important play. So those kinds of things are important at this point. Okay. Um, how, the responsibility. Um, I think that it is my responsibility, first of all, to, uh, as, to the best of my ability, to be honest, to this part. In using, for example, a show like Orange, I think it would be easy for people to write in, for not just African Americans, but specifically in this case, African Americans, but also women, um, sexual orientation, very stock mm -hmm. examples of who those people are, just uh, gender as well in that. Um, and let's take someone like Laverne Cox, who I think is phenomenal and doing and paving ways that I can't even begin to like touch on here. But I think it's my responsibility, in, especially in an environment like that, to um, make sure that what I'm doing is honest, to make sure that what I'm doing is fair and a just representation of um, who this woman is and who these people behind her are and in front of her will be. Um, I think that's my responsibility. I don't, and I mean, I already said it, that it's like I don't do well if the, if, if the story is kind of false in itself. I will probably show those false <laughs> elements to it as well. I will kind of match it where you're giving. But fortunately, in a show like, um, a show like Orange, I feel that we don't run into that example. Um, and I think that I hope that I 
continue to be a part of projects that don't really, um, I've never been put in a position, let me say, where I've felt that I had to, that I was a part of something that I didn't believe in. And I feel like I can speak to that also for my life, generally. Mm -hmm. I feel pretty confident in that. I don't know how they don't find their way to me, <laughs> or maybe I repel my way self away from it, but I don't, I know that's not where I want to live. Well, I think it's a credit to you and the way you go about conducting yourself, but, but hopefully it also is a bit about just the, who we are as people these days, and it's not the same, and that Peter can have these conversations when 15 years ago perhaps it wouldn't have been as welcomed. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully with uh, you know, the creators of something like Orange is the New Black, the idea that they would bring in stereotypical offensive things is kind of foreign to them anyway. They don't quite even understand. It's so passe. That would, right, it's right. so passe, I, I think, hope, because something like, you know, I, I feel like it's probable, it's highly probable that there was a time where a show like that could have been made, but it would have been a totally different oh, yeah. show. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the tone of it oh, to the way yeah. the people that you had even playing in it, but by the grace, you know, we're in a time right now where that isn't the case. The, fo the central focus, and I mean, Genji, who I think is just absolutely a genius, will tell you all the time, she wanted to tell these stories that we never hear. Mm. And I think that conversation is so amazing that that can even be had in this day, and that someone based on that would then pick up the show and allow for mm. that storytelling to exist even. Yes. Um, is just really quite remarkable, and I'm very proud to be a part of it. There's a willingness that I'm starting to see in the business to say, I don't know. I don't know you. Mm -hmm. Tell me about you. I'm going to give you the space. Mm -hmm. We always fear what we don't know, what we don't understand, and that keeps us separated. Um, there's still a lot of that in the business, but I see a core of like-minded people coming together and saying, look, I don't know about you and you don't know about me. Or I'm, this is what I think I know about you, and this is what you may think you know about me. But let's have a deeper conversation here. Let's find out what's really going on. And then allowing that to have voice within the art that we do. Um, I think that's a classic example of that, that those producers said, OK, we're going to trust this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they don't know. They, didn't, they weren't prepared for everything that came out, but they said, we're going to trust this and look at what's, yeah. what's there. Yes. So unstereotypical. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I have to come from a different perspective. Unfortunately, I have not had the career where I've only been able to take things that I love. I've definitely had to take parts over the years, and I've played just about every single part you can possibly think of. Uh, early on in my career, I played a lot of crack whores mm -hmm. whose babies are found dead in a dumpster. Um, and that, to me, was a really stereotypical thing um, that I probably wouldn't have chosen to play. Actually, I probably would have. As an actor, that's, that's some pretty fun stuff, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> But you know, I mean, as far as stereotypes go, that was definitely uh, one of the biggest stereotypes I've ever had to deal with. Um, and I've done it many times. I've, I've played that character a bunch. Um, and I found that um, the, the best way to get through something like that is through a lot of daydreaming, a lot of you know, imagining what your life would be like if the circumstances were different. Mm. Um, because we all have that ability in us to be crack whores. Like we do, we do. It's one bad decision that you make, you know? So I think getting through those parts, um, uh, other parts that I've played that are stereotypical, I've played a, 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 a boxing lesbian. So, you know, like stereotypes, you know? Uh -huh. um, and the, the way to get through it is, you know, you're putting yourself in different scenarios. You know, I would never be, let my baby die in a dumpster, but you know, Perhaps if given, given enough crack, I might. <laughs> and, and so that's how you get through it. I mean, I wish that I could say that I, I've only been offered parts that I'm, I've been proud of, but I haven't. And I think that's a large part of being an actor is n knowing that it's not all going to be sunshine and rainbows. You know, you're going to have to take a part on a soap opera for six months. 
You know, you're going to have to pay your bills. So how do you sell soap opera acting? Because soap opera acting is not good acting. So how do you do that? You, you just you, you try to be as truthful as possible. Be, be as truthful in the circumstances as possible. Um, one of the things we learned in college was we, we, you would get um, um, uh, bad script on purpose and, and learn how to make it work because that's part of, you know, that's part of what's going to happen. If you're not, even if you don't land those parts, you're going to have to get in the audition room and sell it anyway. I've had to do gym, uh, a Caribbean accent more times than I can even tell you. And I'm not Caribbean. I'm not Hispanic. I've had to do, I've had to learn Spanish. And, and do it on screen. And I'm like, you know, these are they're huge obstacles for me. But, you know, you be as truthful as possible and wing it, <laughs> you know? And that's, that's. I appreciate I appreciate the candor. I mean, I think that's right. I think that. The, there are it, bad parts out there. And it changes, oh, yeah. it changes over time in your career as well. I mean, plenty of them. You, you make certain decisions and your career right. evolves and, and hopefully you get to a place where you have some more control over things. That's and, right. And, and the, the, the things that are coming to you change, hopefully for the better, as we, we, we've seen that they have. I mean, I've always considered myself a pawn. You know, I'm not the director, I'm not the producer. I'm the person you put the, the little chess piece on the board and they move me where they want me to. It's my job to know what to do when I go to that next spot. It's my job to listen to what the director wants and then flesh it out. Whatever, however that is, you know? And that's, that's through history, it's through preparation, it's through homework, it's through da-da-da-da-da. But um, that's, that, I, it, if I'm the pawn, then, then my job is to sell it and to make it work. Mm -hmm. Well, the amazing perspectives that we've gotten this evening and from different um, aspects of the industry and different experiences, I think that um, They've been varied and, and um, quite multidimensional, but I think the, sa the same thing could be said, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm going to. Um, I think that one of the things that, that, that everybody talked about um, very passionately was you really have to know who you are when you go into the room, when you go in to do the work, when you're around other people, when you're in this business, because it's so easy to lose that. Um, and there's no one right way to do it. There's no one person to be in order to succeed. You must just be truthful to yourself and seek out the truth in those stories that you're asked to tell. Yeah. And in the room are future storytellers who will hopefully one day employ uh, you all uh, in, in their uh, next Oscar and Emmy winning project. Available. <laughs> Especially if it's comedy. <laughs> But let's thank our panelists one last time, please. Tawny Cypress. Thank you. Peter J. Fernandez. <laughs> and Uzo Aduba. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. thank you to the mayor's office. Thank you to the SAG Foundation. Thank you, New School. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll see you next time.